I hope you see my screen and it is my great pleasure to talk about exosomes and epitranscriptome, two kind of different stories that is being uh, put forward uh, and worked on in my lab. And I thank you all for joining. And uh, this is, uh, I'll straight dive into science. Um, these are two emerging concepts in biology. Well, exosomes, not so much. It, the, the research has been around for 30, 40 years now. As you can see, the research publication landscape, they were both originated, the original idea and concept existed in 1970s, and no one really picked them up until there were significant discoveries in both fields, and now they're growing exponentially. So the exosomes field is well ahead, and it's kind of an established research with you know thousands of scientists working on it right now. Epitranscriptome is a little bit novel, more novel than exosomes. So what I would like to discuss today from the work in our lab is exosomes in cardiac regeneration, in gene delivery, and cardiac epitranscriptome. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, not only because it was uh, produced in my lab, um, but you know what it implicates. This is a stem cell human CD34 positive uh, hematopoietic stem cell, and you can see is my uh, a mouse implicates here, um, there, there is inward invagination of a vesicular body that is shown in the TEM micrograph. Those are exosomes budding in the multivesicular body membrane and they're being pinched off and then pushed to the multivesicular body uh, lumen. And when this multivesicular body, as the name suggests, it contains multiple exosomes which are double membrane bound, they fuse with uh, plasma membrane and the vesicles are secreted out. And how do we study them? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, we collect the conditioned media of cultured cells or the biofluids they are secreted to, such as saliva, blood, urine, any kind of possible bio biofluid, even from plants, bacteria, they are known to secrete these vesicles and we can isolate them in its native form because these are very resistant uh, vesicles. Um, which can resist digestion, heat, and you know, very robust uh, double membrane, similar to plasma membrane. However, has uh, and, you know has been shown that they are enriched with sphingomyelin cholesterol that makes um, the exosome membrane very resistant. So what we did, we isolated the exosomes from the human stem cells, which are isolated, the cells were isolated from patients after apheresis and GCSF mobilization. And we wanted to study what is the function of these vesicles and we performed, and I have to say these experiments were done about uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, now it would feel very primitive, but that's where we started. So we took the total condition media um, of the stem cells, uh, which were thought to function by paracrine mechanism. So this is a simple assay where the Huvex formed tubes on matrizel, and you can see the condition media itself is forming tubes, which implicates the angiogenic property. We separated the condition media into exosomes and exosome depleted condition media. And fascinatingly, we saw only exosome fraction is forming tubes, meaning retaining the angiogenic function of the condition media and not the exosome depleted fraction. So that was interesting. And we went ahead to study the therapeutic and beneficial function of these exosomes uh, in two models. One is Heinlein ischemia model, uh, where we like get the femoral artery and myocardial ischemia model, where we like get the coronary artery in the heart of mice. And then next we injected the exosomes to study what is the beneficial effect they bring about. So um, this has six groups. At the bottom right is PBS control. You can see this is a very severe model of um, uh, ischemia. The mice lose their limbs. And when we injected the cells or the condition media or the exosomes, each isolated from equal number of cells so that we can compare their activities you see the mice retained limbs. Uh, and um, uh, when we deplete the exosomes from the condition media fraction, the beneficial effect was gone, reiterating the same effect that we saw before in vitro. 
And interestingly, we took another control cell type, which is total mononuclear cells from the blood depleted of this stem cell fraction. And you see these different types of cell, even if they are cultured under the same media, they did not have beneficial function. So this implicates these exosomes, vesicular fraction, not only mimic the therapeutic activity of the cells, but also has their own beneficial uh, effect and can be used as an independent therapeutic entity. So this experiment, when repeated in mouse myocardial ischemia model, we saw the same effects of from exosomes uh, beneficial effect, improving the ejection fraction and fractional shortening. The effect was gone when we removed the exosomes. So these cell-free CD34 exosomes were therapeutic. And now when we see literature, there are various different kinds of cells. Um, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, secret cells, you know, it's a very controversial field, but cardiosphere cells uh, published by Dr. Marvin's group. And, um, but what is not controversial is the fact that exosomes mediate the function of these cells. So now many of my collaborators, Dr. Mike Dave, Davis at Emory, Costanja Emanuele at uh, Imperial UK, they are using the composition of these exosomes and these are very well published. And now if you see the microRNA protein and lipid data from these stem cells, <coughs> excuse me, you find uh, several published articles with uh, various uh, microRNA composition from different types of cells cultured under different condition, and they have different levels of beneficial activities such as reducing fibrosis, uh, improving angiogenesis, injection fraction, and the concept behind these studies is, is also to establish, not only to establish exosomes as an independent therapeutic entity, but also to build artificial exosomes when we do not need these biological cells, and uh, these are bio nano vesicles which would have the microRNA or the protein composition of the natural vesicles. So I will turn a little bit and uh, discuss our research, unpublished research on exosomes in gene delivery. Yashwan Liang and Marta Adamiak in my lab. They, um, Yashwan is my past postdoc and Marta is currently working on this project. And um, the concept behind is, is um, AAVs, which are adeno-associated uh, viruses, they are important mediator of gene delivery to different tissues and organs in, uh, in humans. And currently, there are more than two to 300 clinical trials which are ongoing. Gene therapy field is making a strong comeback, um, mostly because these are um, helper-dependent paraviruses. They are non-integrating and non-metagenic. They do not integrate into the genome and result in long-term expression. In addition, AVs can impair tropism, like they can go to liver, different AVs, different serotypes. They can deliver more to the brain than other organs. So they are very att attractive vectors for gene delivery. However, the most uh, prominent issue in um, their therapeutic uses is presence of a natural neutralizing antibody. So many of us, we are hundreds of participants here. If we do a test now, maybe more than 50% of will be positive for AVs. And this is AV1 um, antibody distribution in Europe and in the US. You can see 80% of the police population is already positive. And what happens, this, uh, this population, they do not qualify, even if a gene therapeutic approach is very interesting and very effective, this population do not qualify for gene therapy because whenever AVs are injected into the bloodstream, the existing, pre-existing neutralizing antibodies can bind to them directly and they make them unavailable to go to the tissues. Therefore, the concept is that if, we, if some, some way we can en encapsulate the AVs and make them inaccessible to neutralizing antibodies, they may still do their function but evade the neutralizing antibody issue. So this concept it was not put forward by us, but many researchers, decades of research, uh, where it has been shown several different viruses and viral components, protein, part of RNA, is being secreted via these vesicles uh, called exosomes, which are like nanovesicles in the nano, 100, uh, 200 nanometer in size. 
So if you are curious, yes, influenza virus, and uh, you know, uh, there are pictures of COVID which implicate they may have vesicular association. In addition, you know, hepatitis A virus, HPVs, HIVs, they have all been shown to be enveloped in some form that allows the virus to shield from neutralizing antibodies. So in disease mechanisms, it works to the advantage of the virus, but in this case, we uh, exploit that potential uh, for therapeutic approaches. So we saw AV producer cells. They are uh, originally uh, AVs, which are uh, you know exosome associated AVs uh, in the lumen of exosomes, and they're released to the conditioned media of these transfected cells. And if we analyze the transfected cell condition media, you see not only the AVs, there are secretory AVs, which are secreted out more. 70, 80% of the AVs are secreted out. There are non-secretory AVs, which are secreted out less. So this is one of the secretory AVs, AV9, and you see both free AVs, which are non uh, encapsulated and AV exosomes, which are encapsulated, both present in the condition media. So we devised a tedious ultracentrifugation method to separate these AV exosomes from AVs because having AVs in the AV exosome population defeats the purpose of evading neutralizing antibody. So we separated them effectively and characterized them. And interestingly, this TEA micrograph, which is a very difficult, you know, which was difficult to generate, we palleted these AV exosomes and then sectioned them because we wanted to show what is in the lumen of exosomes. So you can see very interesting virus particles, intact virus particles inside the lumen of exosomes isolated from the transfected cells, whereas wild type exosomes do not carry them at all. So we separated the AV exosomes that way. From the free AVs, now we studied the functional effects. And this is um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Nicole Dubois at Mount Sinai, who works with iPS cells. And SERPA is a positive selector marker for cardiomyocyte, human iPS cardiomyocyte. We took this cardiomyocyte, we treated them with AVs, um, just free AVs in the left in black and then in green M cherry, which are encapsulated in exosomes and, and they are equal tighter. And you can see AV exosomes deliver more genes compared to free AVs. Interestingly, when a neutralizing antibody was present in the assay, the AVs were neutralized and they barely deliver anything, whereas AV exosomes retain the efficiency of gene delivery, which was very interesting for us and implicating that AV exosomes, our hypothesis is true and AV exosomes actually do the function that we uh, hope they would do in presence of neutralizing antibodies. So then we moved to in vivo experiments. This is NAV negative mice, which do not have neutralizing antibody and NAV positive. These are nude mice with human IVIG injected before the experiment. And we took free AVs, um, either luciferase or circa is a therapeutic gene or AV exosomes, both the same construct, and we perform an experiment, what happens when we deliver in vivo into the heart. And I have to say, we injected directly into the heart, um, and um, this is the result in a, in a in mouse set where there was no neutralizing antibody present. Mimicking our in vitro data, you can see AV exosomes, even in the same titer, they delivered more, uh, even when neut no neutralizing antibody was present. In the right, we have mouse uh, pre-injected with neutralizing antibody. So the AV mice, which is in the center in the right, uh, you know, you see barely any expression um, generated from free AVs because they are all neutralized now. However, AV exosomes retain this delivery efficiency that was very interesting and exciting for us. And we did the uh, we conclude that higher gene transfer in presence of neutralizing antibody when you, we use these AVs which were encapsulated in exosomes. This is using SORCA 2A, which is, uh, you know, which controls cardio contraction, cardiomyocyte contraction. This is a complicated experiment with six groups, but I'll bring your focus to the ones in red where we show, um, you know, we, in presence of neutralizing antibody, the AV effect was neutralizing, which are in diamonds, and uh, AV exosomes uh, delivered um, 
using exosomes encapsulated AVs, they have better therapeutic function we, when we deliver circazine to the heart. <coughs> so initially I mentioned that this uh, isolation uh, technique using ultracentrifugation is very tedious, multiple day experiment, and most of the time Marta and Yeshuan spend, you know, isolating enough material to, for us to be able to do experiments in vivo as well as in vitro. So to uh, evade that problem, we have a patent application filed from Mount Sinai. Now we collaborate with IBM, who is a, which has a very interesting microfluidic isolation device where the um, particles less than a critical diameter will be deflected to the right, to the left, and exosomes will stay on the right. So exosomes here are 80, 100 nanometers, and AVs are around 25, 30 nanometer. So this is a data where we level the exosomes and you can see um, the dye I labeled exosomes, they are deflected to the right. And this was generated in collaboration with IBM and Navneet Drogra, uh, who is a faculty at Mount Sinai. And you can see compared to ultracentrifugation, use of this uh, nano DLD device, uh, microfluidic device enriches the exosomes much more efficiently. And it's an hour long experiment, one and a half hours, few hours as compared to many days of ultracentrifugation. So we are excited to do our pig experiments, large animal and see where we go from here. But this part, I would conclude that exosomes are important therapeutic entities that may address the challenges associated with cell and gene therapy. So next part of my talk, I would just highlight some of the recent work that we have been doing. And uh, this is epitranscriptome in cardiac remodeling and regeneration. My past postdoc, Prabhu Matia Lagan, he led that project. And most of the data I, I am going to talk about, some are published. Uh, and some are going to be published hopefully soon. Um, so the concept is if uh, you, know, uh, you are not familiar with what epitranscriptome and RNA modification is, RNA is not a plane or linear molecule as we used to think it is. Uh, now the field established that like DNA, this is central dogma where DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, DNA is modified. There are chemical modification known to be present on DNA and protein. These are reversible methylation acetylations. And interestingly, the RNA field, uh, which uh, you know, we did not uh, know what this modification do until a few years ago. Now we know that there are reversible chemical modification exist on RNA. These are like, you know, in a linear bead, these are decorations and they have important function. And that's why the whole field wants to know what is this novel hidden layer of gene regulation. And that's where we started um, when we did a many years ago, about four or five years ago, when we were starting this research, we found some just uh, accidentally came across some literature and saw that this RNA could be modified. And uh, uh, many once over 160 types of RNA modification had been identified all in mRNAs, tRNAs, rRNAs, link RNAs for some reason this modification has not been profoundly found on smaller microRNAs. So it affects RNA function, stability, activity, localization, and anything that a RNA would do inside a cell, whether it is going to come out of the nucleus, whether it is going to be degraded, whether it is going to be translated. So basically anything that RNA does, even including the viruses, um, viral RNA, RNA viruses, um, these are hugely dependent on the modification. And that has been linked with several human diseases. So this was one of the early publication in 1970s that identified this mo modification using very primitive techniques. And they found this virus has uh, M6A, that's uh, N6 methyl adenosine. The adenosine residue is um, modified with a methyl group at the sixth position. And they say that while R and tRNAs possessed complex ba base methyl nucleoside patterns, the distribution is mRNA was quite simple, consisting predominantly M6A. So M6A, uh, which is a short form of N6 methyl adenosine, 
it has been found to be most enriched in mRNAs as well as most has more most profound functional effects. And uh, when we talk about RNA and, you know, at this time, we cannot think about, cannot eliminate our thoughts of, uh, away from COVID. So yes, this paper that I found just very recently, a few days ago, this architecture of COVID transcriptome, and they actually show that this virus has a long poly HL, and it plays a role in viral translation, RNA stability, replication, and also immunomodulation. And it has many um, M6A sites. And, uh, you know, they found it, tried to find a motive uh, using two different types of sequencing techniques. And I would also like to note that HIV, HCV, influenza virus, they all have M6A and they may mediate immunosuppression and viral survival. As I mentioned, this field is pretty new and we are learning as we are talking, you know, new papers are coming out and uh, this is very fascinating information. What this modification do on RNA? So as I said, this is a modification on the sixth position and more than 50,000, 50, I think this slide is uh, a year old. So if I do a literature now, these numbers are going to increase uh, by a lot. And 800 link RNAs are known to contain M6A. And why is it fascinating and important? And uh, this is a graph put forward by Dr. Chuan He at University of Chicago, who, <coughs> excuse me, who is a pioneer in this field of research. And he put forward this uh, figure studying all mRNAs in a cell, human cell. And um, he found that M6A abundance is more at the start and stop codon, implicating important functional um, um, uh, function of these RNA that are regulated by this. In addition, the microRNA binding site also has M6A and um, implicating the effect and function of the RNA in cells and tissues are regulated by this M6A. Many papers that have been published uh, that shows M6A in disease and therapeutics in RNA splicing, RNA degradation, nuclear export, primary microRNA processing, modulation of microRNA mRNA binding, stem cell pluripotency, and any disease you can name today, you can find a paper of involvement and regulation by M6A. There are many companies put forward to, uh, to take advantage of how this M6A regulate our um, uh, disease and therapeutics. They can be therapeutic. And uh, there are several companies, both in the USA and UK, that are put forward and other, other countries um, that is pursuing this line of research. So coming back to our research, we just started very simple. We took non-failing heart. I'm a cardiovascular scientist, so we are always interested what's happening in the heart in disease and in normal condition. So the failing heart here is shown in red, red triangles, and um, which are total RNA. And uh, in circles, it is poly A mRNA. So you see when we take disease hearts in red, there is a significant increase of M6A in the disease hearts. And that was not only in humans, but also in pigs and mice. You know, and uh, we were expecting we would, because this is a very transient effect, we were expecting we would see immediately after MI. Uh, for some reason, we see only significant increase after a week. And um, we are still trying to figure out the, the significance of the late increase of M6A. And interestingly, when you know we took the remote zone of mice and pigs, so all these ABC figures are from the ischemia, ischemic tissues. And when we took the remote zone tissues, we did not see a big change in the M6A. So that implicates it's only located to the active remodeling sites. So we wanted to look at the mechanism. Okay, now that we have a very interesting change, which is like black and white, and you know, very rarely you see such big changes. We wanted to study the molecules in the heart, and there are two different kinds. Um, I think now there are many different kinds known, like uh, you know, that are molecules that help the writer, that help the erasure. But as the name suggests, these are primary molecules which regulate the M6A. Uh, is um, uh, writers which add the M6A and erasers which remove the M6A. There are also readers and you know various different class of molecules, whole family of molecules that are now being uh, shown to affect this process. 
So we analyzed many molecules that are known in literature at that time when we were conducting this research in 2015 and 2016. And we found that FTO, which name is fat and obesity associated, it's very controversial whether it is really, you know, regulates obesity or not, but that's the name of the molecule, not to mislead you. Um, so this is present uh, in high quantity expression is high in the heart compared to other erasers as well as compared to writers. And we found literature that it oxidatively demethylates M6A, meaning oxygen dependent, and it can be really active during ischemia and hypoxia conditions. So interesting facts, these variants are associated with obesity, um, increased risk of uh, Alzheimer's, and also a loss of function mutation, the mice. And I know like some people in Germany, they have a mouse on FTO and that is published that has cardiac defects. And it also leads to arrhythmia, um, some polymorphism, uh, you know, that is shown in this gene and the vicinity of the gene that has interesting cardiac effects. So we found that FTO is decreasing in the failing heart, both at the RNA and the protein level in mouse and humans. And it implicates that when FTO levels go down, because this is an erasure. So when erasure is absent, it, the cell is not erasing enough M6A, and it, it is rational that the M6A levels in a failing heart would stay high. And that's precisely what we see. We knocked down FTO in primary cardiomyocytes, and we found that uh, you know, M6A levels are significantly increased. Also under hypoxia, the M6A levels are increased. And when we overexpress FTO, the M6A level are decreasing, indicating FTO has a direct relation to M6A levels in cardiomyocytes. And we knocked down and we did the ion optics experiments to measure the cardio cardiomyocyte contractility. And interestingly, in line with literature, we found a lot of uh, FTO knockdown cardiomyocyte show arrhythmia that is shown in the red box here. About 60, 50, 60% of the myocytes were arrhythmic when we knocked down FTO as compared to control. And interestingly, the hypoxic myocytes where you, know, you see less function, um, overexpression of FTO also reduced that arrhythmic uh, arrhythmia. And I did not present the detailed data, but we saw many of the other parameters that we measured were uh, positively affected by FTO overexpression and negatively affected, contraction was negatively affected by a knockdown of FTO. So we did our next in vivo experiments and both AV and it's published, um, AV mediated and uh, adenovirus mediated. Adenovirus is transient expression. We wanted to see whether we need the long-term effects because the M6A was upregulated after seven days. Um, so we could not uh, find a distinction between um, AV mediated gene delivery, which is for long-term. And you know, in this case, we already had the FTO high levels when uh, we injected the hearts um, when we did the MI in the hearts at week four. Um, so this is the, uh, the echocardiography data um, showing adeno FTO overexpression of FTO actually rescues the ejection fraction in this heart and also rescues the fibrosis and you know um, the, the percentage of, um, of um, fibrotic tissue scar size and similar effect, which I did not present here, was uh, observed in adeno, adenovirus associated mediated FTO transfer. So sustained and transient expression of FTO was beneficial to the heart. And we wanted to study um, a mechanism in detail. And what we did, merit sequencing, you may find a lot of in, uh, information in literature. It's similar to chip sequencing. However, merit sequencing is complicated because expression of RNA in a cell is also up and down regulates depending on the physiological condition. So we devised uh, methods to neutralize that effect. We wanted to study what is the only M6 cell levels in an mRNA irrespective of its expression. So I'm not going to the details how we normalize that, it's all uh, published. But what we found is in my hearts, the total M6 cell level as we see in our experimental assays, this is from the merit sequencing data, M6 cell levels were increased and when we overexpress FTO, M6A is uh, comparable to the normal level. 
What was very interesting for us is we found a subset of genes that were changed by overexpression of FTO. You can see the top part of the genes were pretty much similar between our MI control and FTO overexpression, but the uh, genes in the blue box uh, are the ones which are significantly changing. And interestingly, um, they are primarily related to the cardiac and cardiomyocyte function, cardio cardiac hypertrophy, heart contraction, muscle filament sliding, so on and so forth. So when we looked at individual uh, link RNAs and mRNAs that are associated with cardiac contraction, we find um, observation which are similar to our hypothesis and other data. In blue, the M6A levels are in particular, and this is myosin heavy chain, and this is blue in sham, and then MI is in true red condition, and FT overexpression in green, so in MI, particularly this location of myosin heavy chain is hypermethylated. And with FT overexpression, the methylation levels are almost comparable to SAM. So we found that for Circa, Rionodin receptor, we did verify this is experimentally from Mary, uh, you know, we isolated RNA, which are methylated and experimentally by PCR, we verified that data. And we also found that the protein expression, not only at the RNA level, methylations are different in circa mRNA, for example, but circa protein expression is also changing in adeno FTO and coming back to the normal levels, implicating this methylation association of uh, increase in methylation and decrease in circa expression and rescue in FTO is, uh, is uh, aligned with our hypothesis. So M6A in circa 2A regulates it mRNA and protein expression. Then we are doing further experiments. These are unpublished data. We found that nuclear cytoplasmic translocation of circa mRNA is changing in SIFTO condition here. So when we knock down uh, FTO, it's shown here in the blue box. Um, in, in pink is the nuclear RNA. So most of the mRNA, circa to mRNA, is retained in the nucleus and not transported back to the, to the cytoplasm. So these kind of experiments are ongoing in my lab, and we are trying to build a relationship of this M6A and what is the overall global protein expression in a, in a FTO overexpressed heart as well as in an MI heart. For that, we did stable isotope leveling by amino acids in cell culture. This is in SILAC experiment using heavy and light, uh, you know, uh, amino acids to tag and uh, to find out which are the proteins that are having de novo synthesis. And to summarize here, you know, we put our, uh, collaborated our MERIP data with the SILAC data and analyzed the pathways and we see calcium, muscle contraction, muscle filament, all these pathways are not only changing at the M6A level, but also de novo protein synthesis. And that provides us very important uh, information about a cardiomyocyte which is undergoing you know, uh, uh, ischemia or hypoxia and how this protein expression changes in the heart and also implicates how FTO can be designated as a beneficial or therapeutic molecule. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to the, go to the details, but just to show individual protein synthesis uh, from our SILAC experiment, how it collaborates with the MERIP data for, for individual proteins. And with that, I would like to say for, for cardiac epitranscriptome studies that in a normal heart, there is always homeostasis and M6A FTO levels are balanced, which maintains the contractile proteins in check their expression. And in a ischemic heart where there is diminished cardiac function, there is a disbalance of FTO resulting in increase in M6A, resulting in, you know, circa uh, retention in the nucleus and low expression at the protein level in the cytoplasm. So with that, um, this is the most important slide. I would like to acknowledge the people who has uh, put in hard work for um, this pu publication, for this hypothesis, and also especially Marta and uh, Yeshuan and Prabhu and uh, Shweta and Sherry in my lab. I would also like to thank Dr. Fuster at Mount Sinai for his consistent support uh, during these difficult times and my mentors 
and my collaborators, uh, both at Sinai and uh, international collaborators, and also my funding sources. I would like to add for the young people who are present here, we have open postdoc position in our lab. Uh, if you are interested in our research, feel free to write to me. And uh, again, I would like to thank ISHR Endeavor for bringing uh, our work to you. And thank you all for your attention. I would be happy to answer the questions. Well, that was pretty impressive. Um, do you mind now maybe just stopping this, sharing the screen and then we can... Uh, yes. There we go. Bye. Well, well, well done. I mean, amazing science, <laughs> truly amazing science. I've actually learned quite a lot from this talk. Um, and, and actually, it's good to know that there are still postdoc positions being advertised. So, uh, so it's fantastic. People for, who are watching, apply. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great lab and, and clearly great projects that they're running. Um, so, so you've got a lot of questions already in the Q&A box. So uh, feel free to open it and... Yes, so I'm going to read the questions. And um, so first question that I read here is, uh, would incorporating AVs into lipid nanoparticles rather than exosomes achieve the same effect? Not achieve the same effect? Yes, it would, but we have to understand where the lipid nanoparticle field, what are the challenges using lipid nanoparticles? Uh, primarily, they do not cross the cell membrane as efficiently as exosomes do. So delivery inside the cell has been a big challenge when you um, use uh, lipid nanoparticles. And as well, you know, uh, devising a method uh, to how these AVs, which are like 20, 30 nanometer, how they, do, they would be encapsulated inside these lipid nanoparticles would be a challenge as well. I am not a bio nanotechnologist, um, but I would assume that would be challenging how to separate um, the viruses which are essentially inside these nanoparticles and viruses which are outside of this nanoparticle. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Should I move? Sorry, but this was a question from Rodolfo Fischmeister. So, so just for, for the audience that maybe can't read it. So maybe just read out who it's from if you can, if you don't uh, mind. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Um, so next question is Claudia Oliveira. Is it possible to know the viral cargo of these EVs? Um, so as much as I understood the question, uh, are you I hope you are implicating um, what is in the virus in the EVs. So we are trying to address that question and I did not show that data because we are still analyzing. So we sequenced the plain viruses and the viruses which are inside the EVs, you know, RNA sequencing, and we are doing mass spec analysis to know whether these EVs, you know, they have also viral protein incorporated into EV membrane in addition to having the whole virus inside it. So these are complex scenarios, you know, whole field is suggesting it is possible. And it's also possible to have, you know, these viruses that do not carry a genetic material. For example, some viruses I was reading, HIV is a huge virus. So it, it is possible that HIV incorporates a part or entire of its genome into the EVs or part of the protein composition into the EVs. So we are running those kind of experiments as much as you know, experimentally it is possible. And we want to also know what is um, going on there. Thank you for asking. Hector Chapoy. What is the difference between neutral nanolipogenes and exosomes? I think this is similar to the other question that I addressed. Um, when you say neutral, I do not know what is it meant by neutral. I'm assuming just you know natural nanolipogenes which can carry the virus. And I think I have addressed that question. Next question is Claudia Oliveria. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing the names. Oh, I'm a little yeah. shy. My pronunciation sometimes is screwed. Yeah. The microfluidic device is interesting. Have you seen how these EVs look after isolating? Yeah, via microfluidic device. And we are not only to running the microfluidic device isolation right now, we want to compare all methods 
primary method exist in the field. So we are going for immuno isolation. We are going for uh, size exclusion. Th those are very interesting approaches, how we can separate the virus and the EV, you know, not only from conditioned media. So th this is a whole, um, you know, big field in exosomes EV science. And I would like to mention here that we, I am a part of ICEV International Society for um, Extracellular Vesicle Research. And we probably would have a virtual meeting. Um, also, it was supposed to held in uh, Philadelphia in May, but considering the current situation, the society is thinking, you know, what to do. But the context in which I bring it in is um, this meeting promotes this EV science, isolation techniques, you know, all this microfluidic, size exclusion, immuno uh, affinity isolation and more and look at the ICEV webpage if you want more information about EVs. Our next question is from Francesca Vacanti. Uh, she is wondering if the case of the imaging exper experiment in mouse comparing AV exosome to AV, do we see a wider targeting effect of AV exosome compared to AVs? That's a very interesting question as well. And I would like to add here when we inject the virus or the AV exosomes, AVs or AV exosomes into the mice. We did a bunch of preliminary experiments that I did not show, not not bunch. It actually was six to eight months of data that we I, I did not show here. And when we do a telvin injection and when we do an intramyocardial injection, there is some difference. <coughs> Why? Because you know, as much as we like exosomes, we also know that exosomes do not target organs. The cardiotropism from AV exosomes, I believe is coming from the AV part. Once the AVs go inside cardiomyocyte and other cells, that's when you see an expression. So the endothelial cells, the fibroblast in our hands, we found that they uptake at an equal rate, this AV exosomes, but just after two to three weeks, they do not express it. There could be multiple reasons. Uh, first is, you know, cardiomyocytes are primarily non-dividing cell types. So they retain their material. When the cell division happens, it kind of get diluted. And there are other interesting mechanisms that we are pursuing and we're hopefully, you know, we'll be able to submit this uh, work um, very soon. Uh, and we did not see a wider targeting effect. We did see in liver and we analyzed the spleen, which had a little bit of, uh, you know, AV expression, but liver, we know the AV serotypes we use, specifically AV9 in this case is cardiotropic. So we definitely saw cardiac expression as well as liver expression. We analyzed the brain and other organs and we did not find much AVs there. So I think more questions from the AV and uh, I am happy to answer them, uh, them all. Um, so I'm not going away for the next 10 minutes, just to let you know. Uh, it says, did you use low doses of AV exosome circa in order to see how low one could go? And it, in, it implicates dosing. This is from Constant, Constantina Stathopoulou. I think I'm not good with Greek names and Dutch names at all. <laughs> <Poor Dina. laughs> yeah. So, so yes, uh, we did not do a viral dosing experiment, but you know, we realized, and this is kind of an interesting question, which asks about AV dosing. And if you remember 20 years ago, when there was one big failure in the gene therapy field, which put the fields, you know, 20 years back, backwards, uh, you know, unfortunate death of, a, of an individual, which was not related to any way the, the effects of AV, I believe. Um, so after that, the field did a lot of experiments to address this dosing effectiveness. And I believe as much as I know, AV's current dosing that was used, not current, past dosing that was used is really low. We can go two, three exponential fold higher. And we started some of the experiments doing 3E10, that's the viral dose. Uh, but I think now all our experiments are 1E11, 3E11, and I have seen folks doing 1E12 even in mice, and they have better expression. So I think, you know, 
the way that would we would like to go in dosing is higher but not lower but i understand your question that what is the minimum amount that could be effective and we do not have answer to that unfortunately so emma robinson um so uh have you performed any reductionist experiment for the effect of CD34 exosomes on the HLI hind limb ischemia model to identify key microRNAs in the exosomes that recovery improves recovery and pro-angiogenic effect? Yes, we did, and this work is published both in 2011 and 2017 <coughs> in CERC research. And I would encourage you to go check our papers for microRNA, microRNA experiments. We're writing a manuscript right now on CD34 exosome microRNA and protein composition. Uh, we hope that you know it would be out sometime in 2020. And um, reductionist experiments, that's an interesting point because I would like to share our experience with the experiments in the heart, not in the hind limb ischemia. So in the heart, when we were comparing normoxia and hypoxia hearts, we took half of, the, uh, half of our normal dose. Our normal dose is 5 million cells per kg. And I would like to include here CD34 cells, human hematopoietic CD34 cells are currently, you know, they used to be in phase three clinical trial because of some complexity that phase three clinical trial uh, for the cells for uh, angina patients were stopped. And I guess they're restarting in 2020, the clinical trial again. And we took, picked our doses from that trial doses. There were two doses used in that clinical trial. We picked the higher dose, which is 5 million cells per kg. And uh, you know we scaled that down for the mice experiments. And for our hypoxia normoxia comparison, we uh, went half down 2.5 million cells per kg. And we did not see a big difference in hypoxia and normoxia. And we assume that's because of the exosomes dose. Because these st <coughs> excuse me, stem cell exosomes are so effective that we do not have a low dose. I think we have to go down to 1 million or maybe 500,000 cells per kg. And exosomes, I have never seen in my life of exosomes research for 12, 13 years now, a cell type that would secrete so much of exosomes as you know, the CD34 positive cells, uh, stem cells. So primarily the stem cells, they secrete more exosomes compared to other cell types, even to the cancer cell type. We compared HeLa cells and you know these were way, way higher. Uh, in their secretion, exosome secretion capacity. So, um, so reductionist is needed, but uh, you know, unfortunately, these are very complex experiments involving mice, and you know, these are very expensive cells, human cells. So we could not do a lot there. We hope we one day we have answer. Okay, these are the minimum number of exosomes that needed to be injected for a minimum, you know, to see a uh, measurable effect. And I cultured 50,000 cells one time, and I see a pellet for exosomes. So that was my another moment I remember, you know, you don't discard anything in science. 50,000 cells can secrete these nanovesicles in which I can, you know, visualize a pellet. So, um, yeah, I hope young folks here, uh, they do not get disheartened and, you know, with any negative result they see. Uh, so there is a question, is it uh, from Marta Schulich? Is it enough to perform one uh, injection of the virus to sustain the therapeutic effect? If ye yes, how long is it effective? So I'm assuming this is the AV, you know, the question is about the AV virus. So AV virus, as I show in our control experiment, you know, AVs, they keep delivering the gene. Once it goes inside a cardiomyocyte, it goes first in the nucleus. It doesn't go anywhere. And we believe it stays there for a very long time, like years. And, you know, people have shown the expression is up for a long time. And that's why these are attractive therapeutic entities to deliver genes. And I don't know if anyone has done long-term studies, like, you know, like maybe five years, I don't know, but at least for one, two years, yes. Um, Adrian Arieta, is the FTO mRNA, this is for a question for our epitranscriptome part of the research, is the FTO mRNA also methylated and 
also regulate its expression and therefore its activity in the disease state? That's a very interesting question. And you know, uh, one would wonder that would be also important how the FTO mRNA itself is methylated and regulated under ischemia and hypoxia condition. And in our MERIP analysis, we found, yes, FT FTO mRNA was differentially expressed, but not as to the extent where we found the cardiomyocyte, uh, cardiac contractile genes, uh, mRNA, that are differentially you know, methylated. So I think um, that's, that's also important how these regulators, they regulate themselves. And very little is known what happens under a stress condition. But I would like to include here that there are few genes whose expression, whose methylation levels do not change at all. And we use those as our control in many experiments that we perform. Uh, so another question from Melanie Vossert. Uh, did you observe a comp compensation mechanism to maintain M6A homeostasis by other M6A regulators after MI or hypoxia or FTOSIRNA? Yes, we did measure metal threes and other metal proteins, which are writers, which do the opposite um, function of FTO. And we saw a compensation mechanism, like, you know, when FTO is low, that means erasure is less, so there is more methylation, so writer would would also their function should, you would expect to go down. We saw those effects, but it was not very significant. And uh, I would like to highlight here, there are other groups that are pursuing this research. And this was in parallel one paper from Feder Federica Cornero's lab in, uh, for, in Ohio. It was published in circulation in the same um, same uh, issue uh, as ours, and they are working on metal proteins. And I would uh, encourage you to go and check that paper. And that paper uh, studies the effect of hypertrophy and how these uh, methyl regulators, M6 regulators, function in those conditions. Uh, this is from Mickley. How do exosomes recognize specific cells to enter? Do the AVs on surface exosomes play a role in that? That's interesting line of thought. And uh, I have to say that exosomes probably has some receptors, you know, these weekends. I don't know. There, is, uh, there are a lot of groups working on this right now, and the papers are upcoming. Uh, but the uptake of exosomes is a very underst uh, understudied mechanism, least, least understood mechanism. And when we apply the exosomes to many cell types in vitro, they just rush through, through to the cytoplasm of the cell. But in vivo, you apply the same exosomes in a complex scenario of myocyte, fibroblast, endothelial cells, and we noticed differential uptake of exosomes. And this is our 2017 SORC research paper in the muscle where we show that endothelial cells uptake these exosomes more than you know, other muscle cells. So what is the mechanism? We are still scratching our heads. And uh, you know, we look forward to papers where people do receptor analysis from the exosomes membrane. And the other part of your question is, do the AVs on surface of exosomes play a role in the heart? So I think there is a 2016 or 17 nature paper on hepatitis A virus in exosomes. And there is a very interesting discussion on whether viruses can stay on the surface of exosomes. And they say it's unlikely for these viruses to be carried, you know, along with exosomes on their surface, like, uh, like you know, around the exosome membrane. It's very unlikely because the viruses are 20, those viruses are bigger. So, and uh, some thermodynamics, some physical interaction that was mentioned is a reason uh, why they would be unlikely, there would be, you know, least likely that these viruses are on the surface of exosomes. Uh, we also did not find any virus physically attached to the surface in our EM analysis. So uh, we routinely measured the size and in our isolates, we see a peak and it's a pretty sharp peak uh, between 60 to 120 nanometer. 
And you can argue, well, if it is a 60 nanometer virus particle and it has like few viruses around it, it may be probably 120, 150 nanometer. Yes, but uh, you know, combining our EM, our um, other analysis, we did some protein surface digestion, which would eliminate this virus uh, non-specific association. Uh, we did not have a clear evidence. Uh, we, we do not think that these AVs can be present on the surface. More questions on the AVs, Rio Juni. As you know, some AV serotypes have cell-specific tropism. Yes, AV9 to cardiomyocyte does encapsulating the AV in exosomes will reduce the tropism and induce off-target effects. That's an interesting question, and I partially discussed that in relation to another question. Um, but we, what we found, and as you have, you remember, our data from in vivo data that we primarily find the AVs, the free AVs in heart and in liver. And we saw the same uh, for uh, AV exosomes. So I don't think there is off target effect. Um, but at the same time, I will add that when we did Telman injection, very minuscule of, of the virus was uh, expressed in a tell but we didn't find major expression in other organs. Like, of course, we saw it in heart and in liver, but you know, the expression was not great compared to when we did intramyocardial injection. And uh, the, the reason for that, we are doing a lot of analysis and uh, you know, my, my postdoc, Marta Damiak, who is conducting, leading these experiments, we have an excellent data showing that um, these viruses, you know, when, uh, how, the tropism is, is controlled. So when we induce uh, cardiomyocyte, when we treat them with either free virus or the AV exosomes, AV exosomes have higher uptake by cardiomyocytes. And they deliver the AVs into the myocyte more to the cytoplasm as well to, as to the nucleus. So I believe the tropism of AV exosomes lies there because we did not find expression in, in um, fibroblast or in endothelial cells, even if those cell types were uptaking the AVs. So I think, uh, you know, it, it is a way to minimize off-target effect because the AVs do not express in other cell types much if they are tropic to one organ or particular cell type. So this I is... Of, uh, I mean, you know, please feel free to continue or yeah. stop whenever you like, <laughs> because... Uh, we, we can go on for as long as you want. So uh, yeah. this is I think I'll answer four or five more questions. There are some <laughs> from the FTO. So uh, this is from Eric Buchholz. Uh, what do you think is the main mechanism by FTO influences the de novo synthesis of, uh, yeah, so mechanism of how FTO affects this mRNA expression. I think um, one way is, you know, as we saw from the data, they are keeping the mRNA in the nucleus if FTO is not present. In presence of FTO, maybe the M6A is removed and the reader proteins, they get access to the mRNA, binds them in the nucleus, drags them to the cytoplasm, thereby the RNA is available to be translated in the cytoplasm. So that's one. But we are also, we have not explored that idea, but you know, other groups in cancer and neuroscience are studying this whether these M6A are responsible to binding to polysomes to, for degradation to be in P bodies. And yes, they can affect multiple as aspects of RNA metabolism and thereby the, the de novo synthesis. Um, so Janosch Palosi, what are the possibilities to deliver EB especially to cardiomyocyte? No possibilities at all. <laughs> I can tell you that EVs are not, uh, you know, uh, specifically delivering to uh, any any cells that is known. There is always they can be uptaken by multiple cell types, and I don't know of the newer research or unpublished data where people are using several ways to target them: antibody, you know, overexpression, this and that. So those there are many ways, like regularly as we do the drug targeting, but exosomes and EVs, as far as I know, they are loved by all cells. And um, yeah, so Likao Liu, uh, is, question is, is M6A modification also play very important roles in other tissues and biological processes? It's unspecific. Uh, I disagree a little bit there because we saw that FTO targets specifically a little, uh, you know, set of RNA and not 
all sets and our merit analysis clearly supports that. The question is, how can we develop therapy heart failure based on FTO mediated pathogenesis? So this is a therapeutic question. As you know, always the, the, when we go for therapeutic developments and these companies are already working, you know, how to target it, how to streamline the side effects, you know, eliminate off target effects. And I think Dr. Chuan He from in University of Chicago, his group is taking a great lead, especially when it comes to FTO and few metals. So probably check their company webpage and the published papers from their group and uh, probably have a better answer. But I think some of these genes, we don't understand how their targets are very specific as we saw in some cardiomyocyte cell types. Couple more questions. This is from Malik Bisharier. FTO is involved in other diseases. Yes, is FTO expressed ubiquitous? Um, it is known to be expressed in many cell types, but um, also it's, it's very involved in other diseases, Alzheimer's, cancer, neuro, you know, neurological diseases, metabolic diseases, DNA damage response, and all those things. And new research is coming uh, forward every day, every week. Um, so expression can be tissue dependent. Some tissues do not have much expression, but in the heart, we found that it is one of the molecules that's highly expressed. Emma Robinson, have you noted any sex differences in F FTO expression? Wow, I didn't ever think about that. And M6M burnance. Um, so our experiments had both male and female, and given a, Estrogen has been shown to increase FTO expression. Yes. Do you think this can be part of the still poorly understood cardioprotective effect? That's a great line of thought. You know, I would be more interested if you do something about it or if you want to do, we can chat more. Thank you. I have never thought about that question. Have you noticed sex differences in your mice? Uh, so we did not. We also, you know, when we overexpressed FTO, we studied the heart weight, body weight, and all those things, and we did not find a big difference or change. And there was nothing that would raise a flag that there could be sex-related changes. But honestly, I have to go back and check it again, you know, what data we got and whether we paid attention if that was a male mice and a female mice. So I, I don't know. We paid attention. Yeah. <laughs> So this is Mihir Parikh. What are your comments on the effectiveness of the epitranscriptome approach for heart failure with preserved rejection fraction condition? So, you know, um, hep peps are, are slightly different and complicated. And I think because FTO directly affects arrhythmia, um, and, you know, contractility, it's not a, it's a great idea also to look at its effects. Uh, but I would think that it would be equally effective, but I don't know because these are very transient changes. So we have to really check those hearts. And in our studies, we took hearts, you know, we, we had several hearts that this, Experiments are challenging because we need kilograms of RNA, you know, to pull down M6A and all those things. So we just took failing and non-failing. We did not subclassify, even if we had like 60, 70 samples, we did not subclassify them. And I don't think we had a lot of hep parts, but it would be very interesting. Yeah. So would you like to, I would like to know, this is Asma Bukholfa, uh, if FTO, plays a role in autophagy. Wow, maybe, you know, because so essentially the way I look at it, uh, when FTO regulates the mRNA expression, mRNA metabolism in a cell, we just specifically looked at cardiomyocytes and we separated myocytes and non-myocytes. I don't know how prevalent the phenomenon autophagy is in cardiomyocyte compared to you know, fibroblast and endothelial cells. So I would think, I think I saw a couple or one paper at least on autophagy and I have to go check it back again. But yes, there could be a M6A effect on autophagy um, because I think, you, you know, a, as a starter, I never discard any hypothesis. And when it is affecting, affecting something broad as an mRNA, rRNA, tRNA metabolism, you would expect that it would affect other major, you know, functions and pathways in, the, in any cells. Uh, Gino Kurian, whether the effect of FTO differ, differ in ischemic phase and reperfusion phase. Um, 
And as you said, it is oxygen dependent. And whether M6A can be identified in blood, yes, M6A, M6A can be identified in blood and in exosomes. Just so you know, we did some preliminary analysis and we don't know why this M6A RNA is differential in a, in a disease condition versus control in blood because uh, I think it's a way of sending the signal out from one cell to the other cell. So that are interesting line of thoughts. So this is the last question. I don't want to disappoint the person. Um, Vishwanathan Rajagopalan, do you anticipate any challenges when exosomes work were to be trans translated to humans? Oh my God, there are so many challenges. And I deleted that slide because of the time, you know, I, I like, uh, it's like what we can talk here. Uh, so major challenges are having GMP grade exosomes. There is there are a lot of um, people working on this. Dr. Marban's uh, lab they did some uh, you know GMP preparation of exosomes from Cardiosphere. Mario Gimona and various people from Europe they are taking lead in this approach. And uh, yeah, it's like major challenge is how do you have exosomes uh, that eliminates the batch to batch variation. There are a lot of heterogeneity in these vesicles in their size, in their content, even if they are originating from the same cell type. So I think these are the challenges as muddy and messy as you know, any other stem cell field or any biological therapeutics. So yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the interesting questions. I, I it induces, uh, you know, interesting thoughts. I have to go back and check, uh, you know, literature. And uh, thank you everyone for the interest. And big thanks to Dever for organizing this and staying with us, you know, entire duration of the talk. I know it's a lot of work at your end. So thank you so much. It's, I mean, amazing talk and actually amazing response to questions as well, of which there were many. In fact, questions are still coming as we're speaking. Uh -huh. Okay. It's yeah, I think we can stop here, probably. I think so, I think so too. Um, but I mean, also, of course, thanks to people tuning in as well. Uh, again, you know, we keep getting great numbers and actually people are staying for questions as well an hour after the talks have started. So thank you for everyone. I mean, we all take a break now um, for, the, for the weekend and actually we'll resume on, uh, on Monday. And, uh, and actually already we've got quite a lot of subscribers or re people registered for that. So Susmita, so thank you once again. Uh, I would just like to, if you don't mind, just keeping you there, just yeah. to announce once again, uh, the talk for, um, for Monday, which is by Tim Luongo from University of Pennsylvania. And of course, I would just like to thank again, the ISHR for supporting this webinar series, for actually helping it throughout. And, uh, and actually for supporting its members as well. So obviously all the information is there. And I will now stop sharing and I will. Yeah, stay safe everyone. Bye, Bye everyone.